So VR works in a really interesting way. It, it uses the user's eyes and brain to feel like you really are sensing something. But that's an unnatural act for our senses. That sort of defies our biological purpose of the, of the senses. And if we don't deal with this, we might end up with an even bigger challenge than how do you capture VR on film. So on our panel today, we have five media psychologists. We're experts in different aspects of cognitive psychology and neuroscience as you apply it to the media experience. We're going to have a discussion here. We do invite you to join in. And then at the end of that discussion, we will open it to questions and answers. And we're going to be looking at that AR, VR environment and what kinds of solutions we can have to the challenges uh, that you're trying to solve. I'm Dr. Jerry Lynn Hogg. I'm the director of the Media Psychology Program at Fielding. And first off, we have Dr. Pamela Rutledge. She's the director of the Media Psychology Research Center. Pam and I actually have uh, designed the brand psychology certificate that we have at Fielding Graduate University. And this is where we teach audience engagement through pers persona uh, development. Pam also is a consultant for the 20th Century Fox Films where she is expanding that concept of uh, personality profiling and then applying it to various media platforms and the development of media ecosystems. So she's going to uh, add to that conversation. We're going to ask her uh, more about that when it applies to VR. Next to Dr. Rutledge, we have Dr. Shane Pace. He's the director of the Lot Project and co-founder and executive producer of Media X LLC. He's an award-winning conceptual designer, and he has 18 years of experience in human behavior analytics and in developing prototypes for applying AR to bring history to life. One of his projects is close by, docked at Long Beach, the USS Iowa. And we're going to talk to him about his experiences with augmented reality and how you can apply that to VR. Next to Dr. Pace, we have Tunisia Singleton. <coughs> She's a writer, producer, and digital communication professional with 10 years of experience in social media and digital media marketing. She has a passion for sports, which we all know and, and love to hear about. And not surprisingly, she's going to talk to us today about sports fans and that extension of that fan experience and identification, which is enabled by digital media. And we're going to ask uh, Tunisia to address that role that VR can play in amplifying sports affiliation. And finally, we have Doc, uh, Linda Durnell. She's the managing partner of Madison Lane Consulting, focusing on high tech and biomedical marketing. And I, I did just give her an elevation. She's almost doctor, as she's working on her dissertation. She is a, a contributor to Huffington Post and adjunct faculty of consumer neuroscience at Fielding Graduate University. So what I'd like to do is um, just let you know of, of something, an exciting project that we are just fresh off of. Um, for the last six months, we've been working with the Department of Defense, working on disrupting the ISIS brand narrative. We've been training PSYOPs guys in media psychology and participating in simulations and that where we are trying to create developing messaging models and also um, giving them tools so they're better equipped to manage terrorist messaging in the narrative space. So let's get this started. Um, Shane, can you tell me, um, set the stage of where we are in VR and maybe give us a little foundation <coughs> on what VR is? Uh, can I ask a real quick question? Um, how many content providers do we have or content creators? Oh, a lot of them. Okay. Executives? Coders? All right, so we'll try to kind of spread it out. I don't want to step on things you guys already know too much about, but um, we'll give it a nice broad perspective. So uh, first and foremost for me, um, the thing I hate most whenever I go to a conference, whenever I go to NAB or CES, is everybody calls everything that uses a head-mounted display virtual reality. That's not virtual reality. Virtual reality is a very specific thing. If you're creating 360 film, call it 360 film. Virtual reality quite literally involves your ability to be fully immersed and engaged in the content. You are able to manipulate and get a sense of self and presence 
in the content. Looking at a live concert uh, is not virtual reality. It's 360 film. Though it is immersive, potentially, it is not virtual reality. So virtual but being reality, able to walk over and sit by somebody might be, right? Right. If I could jump up on stage <laughs> with you know, the Rolling Stones and sing with Mick Jagger, now that would be virtual reality. But just to be a passive observer is not virtual reality. And if you think that's the future of creating an immersive space, I, I, would, I would argue against that. So you're really arguing for immersion. Immersion. That, that immersion, immersion and presence are going to come with your ability to really engage and interact in the environment. It's going to come far less if you're just a passive observer um, in a live broadcast or even a, a recorded broadcast. So where do you hmm. see that going? Uh, I hope it goes to a fully uh, photorealistic, real-time video streaming where you can engage in interaction um, and involve yourself in whatever scene it is. Uh, and I think that will come eventually. I think we're not quite able to get there yet, but we will. I think we'll eventually end up on the holodeck in Star Trek. <laughs> That's my hope anyway. So Linda, what would you add to that? You know, setting that stage of where we are in the VR world and... and uh... I, I would um, agree that the VR technology in and of itself is not about the devices or the products. Um, I don't think those should be the end goals. Um, some might think that, um, but I don't think they should be the end goals. VR technology, as we see it, is more of a, or as I see it, is more of a democratizing force. I mean, I can see it as empowering people um, and information with different immersive and highly emotional experiences. And I think that's what the VR experience is going to be doing and it will be interesting to witness, um, especially as I was talking to uh, Rodney, one of the, um, uh, the participants here, um, making the VR experience in the cultural contents, um, context, understanding how it relates to different culturals. I think that will be really interesting to witness, but bottom line, it will be an emotional and a very immersive experience. Thank you. So uh, let's move this around just a little bit. The title includes stealth. Pam, what do we mean by stealth VR? Well, what I think we're looking at here is, is the idea that the technology has to go away for this to be really successful. Now, that doesn't mean it has to disappear, although that would be awesome. But it does mean that it can't interfere with human experience because when you're talking about VR, you're up against a very powerful VR unit, and that's the human brain. We already have the ability to transport ourselves, to feel presence in other kinds of media. So as, as long as we are creating technology that interferes, we're creating essentially narrative breakpoints in the experience of VR. Because the human brain is wired to create story, to create linear causal experiences in order just to make meaning out of anything. So anytime the technology, it's like that old, you know, when the record was, you know, when you're, when you were learning how to use the old uh, LP record player. Anytime that happens, you are out of an immersive experience no matter how awesome your headset is. So when we're talking about stealth VR, we're talking about getting it to the point where the psychological experience is all and the technological experience recedes. Yeah, I would add to that and say that it has to be crafty in the sense that the development focuses on the needs and goals of that specific user, of that specific target audience. So it's not a uniform visualization or anything like that. It has to be adaptable and have some change that is emotion-centered. Having this human-centered design that's crafty enough to be able to adapt and focus on action and engagement. I think focusing on that is really where the stealthiness comes into it because it's not just a uniform blank, I'm put on a headset and, blah, and just look around like it has to, <laughs> give me something and tap into me emotionally or the commitment won't even be there. You'll try it once and walk away. Right. And I think it's important to add to that that it goes beyond user experience design and it goes beyond HMI. To reach that level of, of engagement, you need to understand the psychology behind what the viewers are engaging in and experiencing. And, and as we know, engagement is evidence of impact. So as long as there's engagement, we have impact. <laughs> Well, Linda, let's continue that. So what are the critical psychological and experiential issues that um, impact VR? Well, like we're, there everybody was talking, emotion has been consistently shown 
to strengthen memory traces. And um, Anne was coming, came up to me before we started talking and being a producer of, um, of uh, um, a film on, on rape, this is where VR could have profound impact, where you know it is such an, Im an immersive experience. By being immersive, it is highly emotional. And when you have emotionality with that, you will, it will strengthen your memory traces. So sometimes that's a good thing, depending on what, you know, but you can also add other memories in, I suppose. So those are things that we'll, we'll see what, what will happen. But it increases the impact and the retention of information either way. So when you look at disruption, especially from the VR disruption for good, we're looking at, you know, um, emotion and uh, retention of information, and um, which is why we need to be mindful of what we say and what we, what we create, what experiences we create for people, because it is, um, it's going to have a profound impact cognitively. So Pam, how would you take that sort of beyond neuroscience? Well, I think that, you know, cognitively we could look at we could look at three different things. One is which, I, which we've talked about a little bit is the idea of story, is that we automatically are creating story in every experience. That's a huge challenge for the storyteller in virtual reality because you're also trying to give the user or the consumer flexibility or the ability to move around, which is to say then how do you direct their attention so that they're getting the right plot points, so it isn't inception continually. Um, for the entire experience. With users having that kind of freedom, they also are framing their own vision. And as a filmmaker, you had the ability, or as any kind of media producer, up until VR, you had the ability to provide context so you could provide the relevant meaning visually, experientially, with the plot. Now you don't have the ability to, I, there, to contain that. So all of these bits are isolated and the schema of the user or the way the user makes meaning out of something is going to shift their understanding of the story. So you have to really understand the user and know what these sort of meaning packets are so that they don't end up in a completely different story. understanding than was going to make sense to your overall story. The other thing that I think is super important is to think about what we would call cognitive dissonance, only this is going to be perceptual different dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when you believe something and then something challenges your worldview and then there's that like, you know, momentary brain fart and you either change your point of view or you change the channel, right? Well, what we're having now is perceptual dissonance. In other words, Something is moving, I'm not moving. Now obviously the, the manifestation of that that we're seeing now is motion sickness with VR. So that's a really overt form of perceptual dissonance. But we're essentially screwing with the brain, right? The brain has all of these perceptual things that we use as our biological imperative for survival, which means that our brain is not going to be happy about getting conflicting information. Now that doesn't mean we can't do it and we can't do it well and we can't have wonderful and meaningful experiences, but it means you need to know where's the point when you're creating discomfort beyond motion sickness because there's gonna be psychological discomfort and where's the point where you're creating a powerful experience, where you're working with the brain, where you're providing the amount of comfort that you need to in this environment to allow the user to feel comfortable to have that level of um, sort of giving up the the attachment to reality. There's an expression well, for that that I'm currently having my own brain fart on. So. I think <laughs> I think also that it's it's an interesting um, uh, statistic that the average person experiences fight, flight, or freeze responses between 50 and 200 times a day, anyway. So you may think, oh, yeah, okay, I'm a little stressed. But it goes deeper than that. And like, um, like Pam was saying, based on these findings, you know, the prefrontal cortex, you know, when you're feeling stressed like that, the prefrontal cortex is just where you make your, your, your best decisions just is not, does not function optimally when you release those stress hormones. So when you're designing something that's going to put someone in that stress environment, you know, we need to be very careful about what is exactly are we creating. 
especially if we're already stressed before we go in. Now, the other side of that is the VR experience can be highly um, successful at reducing the stress that people are feeling or post-traumatic stress syndrome or um, any sort of trauma. So it works also on the other side of it. So here we have again, you know, an incredible example of disruption for good or for yeah, so otherwise. Yeah, it's in the, yeah, so it's a question you know? of knowing how the levers work, right? So it's, exactly. it's being smart enough at the start. But understanding that cognitive component more so than any other time in, in this technological history. And I've been in tech since the 1980s and you know, that was never really a factor. We just didn't really think about it. But now with this, it's imperative that we do. I would think we would all agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it has to be seamless, that experience, because if these touch points that we're creating are so convoluted and too confusing, and then we get this cognitive depletion and the stress rate goes up again, and then we're completely, we're mm -hmm. being counterintuitive. We're now just adding mm -hmm. more disruption to the disruption, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna be as effective. Mm -hmm. And you do want engagement. I mean, you that's want engagement. Point. I think that's the so, um, but how you go about it in this particular environment could be very different than what we've seen before. So. Yeah, and Shane, I know you've done a lot of work with inattentional blindness. So, how do you, do you see that fitting in with VR? Uh, inattentional blindness itself, no. Does everybody know what inattentional blindness is? Why don't you? Inattentional blindness. Why don't you give them a quick sketch? So, okay, so inattentional blindness is the idea that, that human attention is a limited resource. And we can only pay attention to so many things at one time before that attention starts to be split up. Right, so anybody that tells you, oh, how many people here are really good multitaskers? No, you're not. <laughs> you think you are because you can do multiple things, but the more you pay attention to multiple things, the less you pay attention to any of them. So what we're really good at telling ourselves is we're really good at not doing anything good at all. Or task so, switching. Or task Maybe switching. Nice yes, yes, saying, whatever. Yeah. So yes, task <laughs> switching. We're not good at ta we're good at task switching, but to provide the needed attention to any one task uh, at multiple times, it, it becomes limiting. So when we're talking about an intentional blindness, it's the idea that when we're paying attention to things. Um, we're giving our conscious perception the opportunity to see what we're seeing, to understand what we're seeing, to make meaning out of it. When you are overloading your attention on one particular thing, if you're too fixated, you're tunneled on one thing, you can start to lose your ability to see other things around you. Um, you can even start to lose the ability to see very obviously uh, and blatant things around you. Um, anybody drive home on a daily basis and one day you're driving home and you get home and you said, how the hell did I get home? I don't remember driving. That's an intentional blindness. You're not paying attention to the tasks at hand because you're too focused on something else. But when we're having that in inattentional blindness experience, you can actually um, lose sight of the blatant and the very obvious things that are in your visual focus. Um, so even if it's in your direct line of sight, you might not be able to see it. There's a classic experiment uh, called gorilla basketball, um, selective attention test. Um, in this test, how, how many of you have seen that? Everybody familiar with uh, it? So for those not familiar with it, basically it's a video showing uh, two teams of basketball players, uh, one in white shirts, one in black shirts, bouncing a basketball back and forth to each other's teams. Um, your job is to count only the amount of times the team in the white shirts passes the basketball to each other. So you think, okay, that's a simple task, right? But there's so much going on in that scene that your brain is not paying attention to, but it's unconsciously perceiving, you've got all these processes going on that halfway through the video, 60% of vi uh, viewers of this content miss the fact that a person in a gorilla costume walks directly through the video, stops mid-screen, turns, beats its chest, and walks away. Um, I love showing it at conferences like this because it always gets the same response anywhere you show it. No way, I just missed a gorilla. And you rewind it and show them, you missed a gorilla. So inattentional blindness is the idea that you can miss that, that gorilla in the midst. Um, when it comes to VR, I don't see that being as big of an issue because when we put the, the head-mounted displays on, we lose everything else around us anyway. So I don't think inattentional blindness will be an issue with VR, it's certainly with augmented reality, as my research has shown, but when we're in the VR space, attention is going to be something that is crucial. Um, and like Pam was talking, you're going to need attentional cues to show your person, your, your user, where you need to be focused on. So if you're telling a story, you've got to direct that attention to that story plot or that plot point. 
Um, if you just let it be free flowing, it might make an interesting experience to use over and over again to try to figure out all the different things going on in the story. But y your attention definitely needs to be drawn and focused uh, for your user. Yeah, you so need signposts that are part of the story. Yes, yeah. yes, you have to be directed. So that, and following that line of attention, Tanisha, your research is with fans and the fan experience. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you see VR possibly contributing to the fan experience? Yeah, well, sports media consumption has transformed essentially into something that is very emotion-centric and very engaged now. When we think about the first types of media that we use to consume sports, I mean, back in 1901, the first reported incident of like consuming a sport was through telegrams. There was a mechanical reproduction of a play-by-play -play of a Kansas City, or I think it was Kansas and Missouri, a college football game. So there was literally like a runner, like someone that was at the game, fumble, ran back, put it in a telegram, and then there was a group of a thousand people sitting in an auditorium like, yes, but who recovered? Damn, ran back, <laughs> another telegram, and then they were literally engaged, locked in like that. So when we think about telegram, play-by-play -play from mechanical mm. reproductions, you know, Western Union style, mm. into radio broadcast, into television, into HD, into virtual reality, to now the NFL has announced they're gonna be streaming their Thursday night games on Twitter. Everything now has focused on social media, social mm. engagement, and building experiences. And this really parallels the multidimensional identity that fans have. Fans want a lot more now. Sport represents so much more. Especially now, I mean, you have the city's name in it. We have the Denver Broncos, Los Angeles Clippers, or whatever. And then there's the vocational things. There's all these external group identities where, where we're talking about industry now. The Pittsburgh Steelers, mm -hmm. the Green Bay Packers. Like, there are things that are representative in sports. And people, fans, we identify with all of these things. And it really turns into this really complex issue when you start to look at VR now. It's like, all right, if I want to watch the Super Bowl, all right, I don't have $50,000 wherever to sit in the most prime time seat or something, you know what I mean? Or I want to sit courtside at the NBA Finals. What is that like? Something like $60,000 for a box suite and multiple, multiple thousands of dollars. So VR is going to be able to let you, from the comfort of your own home, watch these premium experiences and feel like you're there. But the thing is, there's different types of fans. We require different things. In a preliminary study that my research partner and I, Matt Price, back there, what we did, we looked at virtual fandomonium and the efficacy of using um, immersive media like VR to consume sports. And there are different types of fans. I can't spill everything that we talked about in our research, but about 70% considered themselves to be a super hyperactive sports fan. But they, oh, but they said they only watched zero to one game per a week. It's like, what? If you're a massive sports fan, like you only watch like maybe a game a week? But that shows fan identification isn't, co isn't contingent upon how many games you consume. It's in your heart. It's part of your identity. It's an emotional attachment that you have. And some of the fans that we surveyed, they said that they're, there's like super locked in guy. He's there, he wants to watch nothing but the sports. He's, zone, he's zoned out, he's got that intentional blindness. He's like, I'm focused on the game, my stats, my favorite player. Maybe he's got a fantasy league, maybe he's got something. But he's locked in guy. And then you have this rage of super millennial fans now that want to be a part of their team, they want to be a part of their group, and they're like high-fiving each other. It's like, yeah, yeah, and one. And they want to have that social media engagement. They want to be able to share with their friends that they're watching this. They want to be able to share it with, if you're a Steelers fan, but you're living in LA, I want to feel a part with my family that's still back home in Pittsburgh or something. VR can be that conduit to strengthening the bonds and the connections to multiple things. So one of the things that, it's, it's a work in progress still, but I think one of the things that VR is going to have to do is going to be able to have to have a controllable feature where you're able to be locked in guy or whoosh, and be able to high five somebody else with you and still enhance that, that group identity. Yeah, I think the social is going to be a real, social is going to be going huge. To be huge because the humans are fundamentally social animals. <clears throat> Absolutely, that's our primary driver for all things. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's going to be a real yeah. linchpin, in, especially in sports where people share identity yeah. and affiliation. Absolutely, there's so much going on in social media, especially with Twitter. That that's kind of become the go-to for um, activity in digital media spaces anyway, because they're live tweeting. They have to, did you see that play? Like, you have to 
a lot of fans have to be able to do that because our group extensions are exper- like are, are spread out. Especially like if you're a displaced fan, if you're a Bears fan, but you're out here or vice versa or wherever, you want to feel some sort of connection. So VR is going to be probably that next wave of immersion as that platform where I can feel like I'm back at Wrigley Field as a Cubs <laughs> fan, and but I'm actually in. Studio City or whatever. So, so that, that brings up the question, what are those essential components of VR? What, what do we actually need to have to have VR work well? <clears throat> Shane, do you want to start this sure. one? So for me as a media psychologist, it's all about story, story, story. And it doesn't have to be an unbelievable script of dialogue. It can just be an unbelievable script of visuals. But if you don't have that story, it's going to fall apart quickly. Matt and I, Matthew Price and I, uh, soon to be doctor. So many shout outs. I know. Uh, (laughs) We're just at NAB, and we were uh, sitting in an experience uh, being shown an 8K um, broadcast. And they were so excited about their 8K experience, and they were showing it on this massive screen. And 30 seconds in, I'm bored, like, let's go. What's this all about? It's because they had no story, not even a visual story. It was just visuals, just throwing it up on the screen. And it was terrible. So story is that universal language that defies the human condition. Um, gamification, it's one entry point uh, to immersion. Um, but even here, we need our epic story to get us engaged. You know, I want to make Link save the world. You know, I, I, I want to play as the stormtrooper in you battle for it. You got to have that task. Um, and to tell and create connections, we identify universal languages. Um, that define our human condition. It's things like uh, our, our empathy, our, uh, our expressiveness, our anger, our different emotions. Um, this creates the bridge for connection through story. Our path through our human evolution has been uh, quite steady. We've evolved the desire for connection. This is what we call evolutionary dynamics theory. Um, we want to be part of a group. Um, or we want to make sure that those who are not part of our group don't join our group, and this is called in-group, out-group theory. Um, we also want to maintain our own individuation. This is called uh, optimal distinctiveness theory. So we can take all these things we know from psychology and apply them from the offline world that we've studied them in to these online environments. Uh, these are all well-accepted theories, um, but it's all about that story. If you don't yeah. have that story, whether it's a visual story or it's the scripted story, you're not going to connect with me on that human level. And, and I, I, will not I want think to that's I'm going to guess that the audience has heard story quite a bit story, in the last story, few years. Story. I mean, that's really that's where story. it's all out. And actually, um, so Pam, I know you've been working with um, profiling platforms and storytelling. Do you want to um, continue that? Uh, sure, yeah. I've been doing some, some interesting research trying to develop some personality models. We know from, from the research that we've been doing and that, that we all are familiar with um, that different personality types use different kinds of platforms and tend to use different kinds of media. But there's a very interesting question about what, how content, the personality, the genre of the story, because as you all know, as storytellers, there isn't just a story. There's you know dramas and comedies and stories that you tell all of and stories that are implicit. And, so there's all of these types of stories. How does that match up with the personality of a profile, because, I mean of a platform? So what we're doing is trying to t- extend the personality assessment tools that have been used and adapted for, say, brands, apply them to platforms so that we can get some um, sort of avenue of where's the appropriate type of content that's going to fit this platform because you don't want to take something super heavy and Snapchat it. Clearly Snapchat is a light hearted platform. That one's very obvious. What does that mean for VR? Does VR have an implied message to the receiver about the kind of content they expect to be receiving? So that's the kind of work that we're doing to try and make sure that when 20th Century Fox Films advertises its next film that it's spending its money with the right tone on the right platform for the right audience so that we've got that kind of lift so that we're not wasting money with a mismatch of personality across those elements. And Tanisha, I think you wanted to add something too with the storytelling. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to link the brands, which is what, what you were alluding to, and making that seamless connection because if there's, it has to 
it has to be authentic. I think that's what you're talking about too in terms of like having the right platform with the right medium. Like everything has to be authentic because we're a lot smarter than people think we are. And when we <laughs> assume, I don't mean like we, I mean like us as users, like the, right, all, yeah. of us, all, all of us, us as consumers. <laughs> like <laughs> all we're all, this is a very smart panel. This, well, we're we're smart panel. <laughs> I mean, users in general, consumers, we're a lot smarter than maybe the product developer will allude to. And if we spot anything that's mildly phony or that doesn't make sense, we're turned off immediately by that experience. And we've shifted from this products and goods services and, and commodities like into an experience economy, which is from this great book um, by Joseph Pine called The Experience Economy. And he's focusing on how authenticity needs to reign through regardless of platform. Like I don't care how many bells and whistles you put on something, if you don't tap into me emotionally, I'm out. And especially if it doesn't make sense for the content and the purpose of that medium. So. Where's <laughs> where where's VR d been done well, and and why? Pam, do you want to start this one uh, out? Well, sure. Um, I, you know, I think there's there's a lot of really interesting examples, and there's some very interesting things going on where people are really pushing the envelope on storytelling. I think some of the most powerful and the most effective so far have been in the therapeutic area. Um, there's some very interesting work being done that I particularly like where people are in a virtual reality with their future selves. And what this has done is it's allowed people to change their, um, their sort of valuation of time. Humans by nature have a very poor ability to um, to calculate risk in the future. So we have a lot of people that don't save, they spend all of their money, they end up um, in a rather bad way when they sort of get to the point where they want to retire. And so what they've been seeing with the ability to exist in a virtual reality with your future self is a great, I know, <laughs> is a greater sense of empathy for your position later and more pro-social and self-care decisions in the near term because that outward point that seems so distant has become much more real. And so that kind of potential, you know, the U.S. savings rate is embarrassingly low. I mean, it's just one statistic out of a zillion. You know, it's like 1% or 3%. I mean, it's, it's not enough to retire on the ability of people to make judgments about what to eat or not to smoke or all of, you know, whether to exercise in the near term get discounted very heavily in terms of the long-term impact. And so a research like this that allows you to see a different kind of um, a discount rate, so to speak, on, on those behaviors can be a very powerful thing in sort of the overall health of the population and the sort of general economy just because of the drain of, of health services. So I thought that was very profound. So Linda, I know you're a big advocate of virtual reality for good. Can you take that into the global setting and what you possibly have seen? Sure, Jerry Lynn. Um, social advocacy, as we all know, um, is good. Um, but with virtual reality, we're taking things a step further, and I like to think of it as like advocacy immersion. And I don't think there's any technology, obviously, where um, immersion is, is, uh, brings people closer to the things they care about, whether it's what Tanisha was talking about, the fan experience, or whether it's um, global warming, or um, watching the, the sea levels rise, or um, any conflict in a war zone like what we just experienced with the Department of Defense and Homeland Security and even British Intelligence, MI6, can you believe it? And um, I know it just sounds just so amazing. I'm such a Bond fan. I can't believe tell I was our children them. We were spies. I know, I got a lot of street cred about that. And um, but nonetheless, even in that situation, very seriously, you know, we're disrupting the way messaging is occurring and that disempowers populations in conflict zones. So when you look at something like that and how VR is eventually going to um, um, help heal humanitarian crises, is not so much on boots on the ground, but in, in terms of we're here and we're experiencing it. We're immersed in the same conflict or the same crisis that these other people are, are, are actually involved in. That changes everything because, again, we go back to 
the emotional part of our brain. That's where we make our decisions. And although some people hope that we don't make all of our decisions in that emotional space, it's the easiest thing for our brain to do and that's usually what happens. So I look at social advocacy, this social immersion, um, uh, this advocacy immersion as being a huge area for, uh, for VR, for disruption, for, for good. So. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Tanisha, we've already talked about a few different uh, pitfalls. Do you have any um, ways that you want to further that conversation about what types of pitfalls we might have in VR and solutions for those? I think we touched on um, a, few of it, a few of those points earlier, but definitely I think it's still that type of, of mysterious medium in the sense that creators need to ask themselves, all right, how do I tell a story when the audience is already present in it, right? It's making that, like, what, what do I do? So it's necessary to do the research prior to make this human-centered design to eliminate any potential disruption that's going to diminish and belittle this experience and make it totally counterproductive. So I think focusing on that would, would be, is a potential pitfall, making things that are too, uh, too disrupting, and then also, we touched on it earlier, it's that sense of belonging and connection and engagement. So there has to be a social feature, I think, added in there. Because regardless of, like we said, like with all these bells and whistles, if there's no way that I can share my, this experience that I'm having with you and with my friends and family, wherever they are, mm -hmm. then it's, what's the point if you don't, if you're not able to share it with someone? What's the, yeah. the, the lifespan of this experience that I'm having? If I'm able to share it, especially in social media, and then get this trend and thread going, then the lifespan of this experience is it's, it's growing. And I think that's the point of this. So I, I hear that it's very social, mm -hmm. or that, that you can see it as a, the potential to be very social. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, what I hear, at least from all the naysayers, is I've got my goggles on. I'm in this very isolated um, experience. So you're, you're, how would you be able to then kind of break that wall that we're that barrier that we're talking about right now to make it that social experience which sounds incredibly powerful yeah yeah it's I don't have the answer yeah. but it's certainly <laughs> something I know you I guys know. do <laughs> yeah. how do you do it is there a switch is there a button like, I don't well yes yeah, so I think social acceptance is going to be a big deal for the VR community to get legs under this because I just saw a headline and it said VR completely turns your child into zombies. <laughs> and it's accompanied by a picture of a kid with a headset and they're going, you know, and they, you know, and that would be concerning to a parent. You know, the jaw, the slack jaw, the right? And then they show you a picture of the new movie theater where everybody has on a VR headset. And it's, you know, it, it could not be more like the science fiction movies of these dystopic societies, right? So Unless you've experienced VR, then you're, you're going to be very resistant. And we're still working off headlines like email hurts your IQ more than pot, Twitter and Facebook you know, destroy moral values, and social media turns you into a flaming narcissist. Right? We're doing that when adoption of social media is 90%. So what's the PR campaign that needs to happen for the VR community to get VR more socially acceptable? And so I think that wedge is going to have to come through education, through therapeutic uses to really publicize those benefits, rather than just have it look like another form of entertainment that's going to suck the brains out of a kid. Now, frankly, I don't believe that those bad things happen. But I do want to point out that this social or the um, sensory balance is a primary means of childhood development for social interaction, reading, writing, spatial relationships. That stuff isn't set until a kid's about 10. So we have to be very careful in how we're thinking about VR and the way that it's diddling with our senses and the information to the brain and kids and be mindful of that. Not that we shouldn't do it, not that we shouldn't let kids experience it, but that we have to understand that the parents with the pitchforks are only going to get the literature that supports 
their point of view. We talk about cognitive dissonance, right? Yeah. And we've been battling that with social media, we've been battling it with the internet, and the I think that is. social acceptance is gonna be a huge deal for that $1.4 billion to have a reasonable ROI. I think it comes down to all of us here in this room, um, regardless of what end of the VR um, spectrum we're, we're working on, is we need to strive for a higher value outcome and much more so than any other type of media. We, we really have to um, understand that we're determined by the media that we ingest and let's make this the highest value outcome that we can um, moving forward, this, the VR experience. And, and what Pam is saying is, is absolutely critical. You can't do what we've done in the AR world for the last 15 years and that's throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had this. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> we've had this rush with AR, and we've had these hills and these valleys of success and failures to try to figure out what's going to work and what won't with the human condition. And if you don't have the human perception in mind, if you don't have cognitive development in mind, if you don't have emotional engagement and the effects of emotional involvement in mind, if you don't understand these things to begin with then what you're going to create is, one, probably not going to be effective. Um, you might have a piece of spaghetti that sticks, but you probably won't. Um, and the other part of it is that you can do harm. There's real ethical concerns with AR and VR when you're just throwing it out there because you can, that you could do potential harm. There's been studies in the past. Um, anybody remember Second Life? Everybody, Way back then. Nobody back wants time. to admit it, but we all kind of remember it. Um, the guy who created Second Life is now dumping millions of dollars into Second Life and virtual reality. Now you're talking about um, a project that is uh, balancing or nearing photorealistic environments. Um, and you're talking about the ability to create avatars now that are almost human-like. When we have that ability to create something so realistic, it tears down that barrier of disbelief and allows our engagement to focus that much faster and that much deeper. And when we have that engagement, it can become difficult in some circumstances to understand what is real and what is not. Um, there are legitimate fears of if I engage in virtual reality and augmented reality in, uh, as well, am I going to be so involved in this that I might enter a flow state? Anybody know what flow state is? That we might enter a flow state and we might lose hours upon hours upon hours. Um, there are stories from VR designers right now that talk about this very thing. They are comfortable with the headsets. They put them on. They're comfortable with the experiences. They're comfortable with the control sets. They get in and they don't realize they've been there for four hours. Now, I'm not one of those lucky people that can spend four hours in VR, about 40 seconds, and I want to vomit. Um, but that'll change as we improve the hardware. That'll change. As we understand how to engage with the content, that'll change and someday I'll be like one of the cool kids and be able to put an HMD on and really enjoy myself. But until you understand how that affects the human condition on multiple levels, um, you're really just throwing spaghetti on the wall. Well, so given those human limitations, where do you see VR, uh, VR going? You know, what's the future of uh, virtual reality? Yeah. Uh, like I said earlier, I think Holodeck. I really do think we're going to get to a point where we're living, or we have opportunities anyway, to live on a holodeck, to go anywhere we want to go, to see anything we want to see, to experience the past, to experience the future, to experience somebody else's reality. Um, imagine being able to, to go anywhere you want and do anything you want to without the consequences of your actions in real life. What if I want to go and uh, go to Aleppo and help the freedom fighters battle ISIS in their propaganda message with the work we were just doing. Well, I sure as hell am not going to do that now, but I might be able to do it in VR. Um, so I think that is the future. Once we overcome the hardware issues um, you know, that cause us the motion sickness, that cause the eye strain, that cause potentially seizures uh, through flicker, I think once we overcome all of that and we can really start to focus in on the content, um, I think that's really where we're headed to an unbelievable future. Do you, I think I, I see, I see um, VR is more of a bridge to AR because oh, absolutely. Fun fundamentally I believe that the most powerful driver for, of human behavior is social connection. And you will never approximate social connection of human form in VR. Now it doesn't mean you can't enhance 
sort of a daily experience with some aspects of VR, but I think it's going to be mixed reality. Absolutely. And it's going to be a blend that still allows people to connect. Because right now, social media isn't replacing connection. It's providing the glue in between the connections. It's actually enhancing and expanding social networks. And there's lots of evidence in spite of all the naysayers. But sitting in a room with a headset without the ability to have social connection is not going to you know, be the end all be right. all. That's, that would be my but, prediction. But for, for, for some, that, that's preferable. <laughs> so we have a sense there's this looming new community, a new type of engagement which leads to purpose and meaning for some people in this environment. And other people think it's this societal catastrophe waiting to happen. And, you know, it's going to replace the human experience. And we really don't know. And maybe it's a little bit of both. And as we've seen technology up until now, it is a little bit of both. It is good. It is not so good. It's, it's destructive. It's empowering. It's both. And how that plays out, we've yet to see, but it might be a little bit of both of what Pam and, and Shane were saying. Well, and we have a joke, um, at least among some of my colleagues, that <laughs> VR is nothing more than a, my gateway drug to AR. Um, and, and I really do see that as well. I see that AR will be the future of the digital experience because it allows us to get out of our holodecks. It allows us to get out of our, our virtual environments and, and add those elements directly to our real world experience. I know. Think which, about golf, man. If you could just like put on the glasses and mm. see the... Come see closer the to the... I'm sure they all want to hear that one. Yeah. <laughs> Tanisha, I think you wanted to add something to you. Yeah. Well, leading the golf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's definitely going to be that empowering tool that will enhance anything that I require at that time because we all have a social yeah. identity. We all have things that different different necessities at any different time in a different mm. environment so yep. if i want to be in pit row at you know at daytona i'm gonna if i want to go <laughs> to the if i want to see the kentucky derby i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to the big hat very right yeah like i'm gonna go and see the things that i'm that i, that I i'm not able to you know it's like people will use vr now especially in sports Right now, to you know, avoid the parking, the long lines, the dirty bathroom, the foods, getting mm -hmm. stabbed in Dodger Stadium, like all of these things. Now, people will just, you know what, <laughs> if I don't want to go to the game, I don't want to deal with all that stuff, then I'm just going to sit home and use VR, and I'm going to feel like I'm actually there. So all those added benefits, you're already getting that immersion and that experience. So I think VR, is, at least in, in the sports world, Sports already has that chokehold on traditional subscriber packages. That's why so many things can't go over the top, because live sports dominates cable. It dominates live television. You're not going to be able, they haven't bundled anything. MLB will, like NFL, it's, you know, you still have to have DirecTV, you still have to have these things. It will always have that chokehold. So VR is going to be a way to, I think, eventually get around that and feel like I'm there. Great. So what we'd like to do now is to open it up to the audience in case some people have some questions. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'll try to speak loud so everyone can hear my question. My question is around memory and um, how is VR and AR affecting the human memory? So 10 years down the line, after a college incident, will my brain think it was really happening to me or do I... So I'm going to That's say that again, a real, I'm paraphrase real quickly. I think you're really talking about that, that neuroscience behind uh, VR and how it might influence or impact memory. That's a really good question. And um, some people are actually using it to um, displace memories. So if you have traumatic memories, they can actually, I hate to use the word implant, but create new memories that become, it's almost like if it was a, a file system with a back door. Your memories are all there, but they're, the, as you don't recall them, it's almost like they're shifted into the back, right? They're pushed backwards. They're all still filed away, but if we don't pull them back all the time, we don't get a lot of use and they sort of fade a little bit. A very overly simplistic thing. Well, this with VR is actually implanting some new memories. And because it's immersive and because the way the brain works, it can actually feel real. You know, and that's the danger, but that's also the beauty where you can actually release or, or, or believe that something else happened when perhaps it didn't. 
And that, I think, is the, the area that a lot of us are extremely concerned about, but also very hopeful in areas of post-traumatic stress and, and um, trauma, any type of trauma, that you can actually find relief that is not in big pharma. And so. Skip Rizzo is doing some amazing work at USC. What's the name? Skip Rizzo. Rizzo. Albert Rizzo is his real name. Um, but if you just Google Skip Rizzo uh, virtual reality, you'll find dozens of studies. But he's doing some amazing work with his team at USC on uh, virtual reality therapies. PTSD. Uh, and it's, yeah, in particular PTSD. PTSD. But it's also being used beyond PTSD. It's also mm -hmm. being used to treat phobias and things like that. Right. But yeah, exactly. there is a chance of good and bad of creating false, false memories and false narratives for yourself. Um, there's not a lot of research on that yet. Yeah, there's some recent research looking at the way VR has impacted the way children recall and it, that it does influence their sense of what was real and what happened, but <clears throat> cognitively children aren't making that distinction pin well between reality and fantasy at, at early ages either. So um, that's one of those areas for concern, I think. Mm -hmm. But you know, interestingly, Samsung has an ad campaign that I think it's primarily in Europe that's called Be Fearless, which is encouraging people to use VR to address their phobias, whether it's mm -hmm. fear of height or fear of flying or fear of whatever. So I, you know, my first thought is, Jesus, I hope they have a therapist involved. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, but there's a lot of potential. But yeah, you know, the brain is plastic. There's we we yeah. learn and we change. It's susceptible to neural hijacking of sorts. Yeah. You know. And it, and, it, and it can do that, where the emotional brain takes over and the thinking brain, uh, again, overly simplistic, but the thinking brain sort of um, can't compete. So um, Right, because, because with that memory, it's what, what value does it hold? What behavior is that memory going to make me do? Like, how is that going to make me feel? So if, you know, if a certain memory sparks back something that makes me angry or something, that's what's going to be long lasting. I don't care if it was filed in reality or virtual. Yeah, like higher, now my behavior is what it is. The more emotional, the higher the memory encoding. Mm -hmm. Right. We had another question. Um, I think the gentleman back there with the blue shirt. I got two actually. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we're actually broadcasting a basketball game in Europe right now. And actually, I think once VR breaks out of the US and actually realizes sports and the rest of the world is actually a much bigger deal than the NFL. <laughs> but uh, Pam was talking about it, and so was Shane about queuing for the story. And you represent an issue we haven't solved, not we haven't solved. That is, so where do you queue? Where is the story? Mm -hmm. And the basketball game is the story of one bucket, is the other in the bucket. And is it at the, where do you want to see the game from? Yeah. In fact, then it creates huge issues for the network because currently they're doing all that programming effort to give you one shot, and they call it the different. Right. There's still a truck. Now, do I put you at, at the front guard? Do I put you at the center? Do I, are you body slammed? Where are you? And how do you take a story up? And what happens to our experience is that people get bored watching. Yeah. So I'm going to right. paraphrase what I think that the we're, we're looking at queuing for story in VR, which is really challenging, and this is very specific to sports because you already are doing a lot, lot with filming um, VR or filming with sports, and the idea that VR is going to open that door globally. So Tanisha, right? Because I believe, like as of now, like you just have like the VR camera there, and it's just like there's a traditional production truck switching, and that's what you're viewing. So you're still not in control. I think, at least with the research that I've seen so far, is that fans still want that control, where I want to see the time out of Doc Rivers drawing up something still, and then I want to be able to go here and still have kind of like this experience. What they're actually doing at AT&T at Park, at where the Giants play in San Francisco, I think it just started now that the season, uh, regular season finally kicked off, but they have an immersive playing field behind center field in the bleachers, and they provide headsets there, and you can, in between plays or whatever, you can go down there and you can go into the bullpen, see who's warming up, you can go into the dugout, see what's going on, you can watch some of the game, you can see batting practice if you go there early, and then you can still watch the game there too and just hang out like in this immersive playing field. So I think even for like the traditional viewer, what I would want, I would be able to, I want control. I want to be able to watch everything. Because even right now, like what we're kind of doing with making our own experience, we've used social media as to become our own producer of Sports Center. And there's a lot of issues right now with these gifts coming out and memes of just like, hey, like that's my content. Like Fox 
that is Fox's content, and you were putting it out there repeatedly, you know, on this continuous loop, like with Vine and everything like that. So, because fans now, they'll just pick up their phone and record their TV, like of their favorite play, of their favorite dunk, and bam, it's out there. And they're becoming their own producers. And I think that type of control, that same sense of I'm controlling the game, that's still what I want. Because the touch points of a narrative game, it's like, all right, especially like with basketball, because there's so much action. Like you're sitting there and you're going, it's not so much like tennis, like you're going back and forth, but I, you do want to be able to be there and see things, and especially when they go to breaks and timeouts, that's normally when people go up, go to the bathroom, they get a drink or something like that. That's when VR should allow you to go into the timeout huddle. That's when you should be able to go over there. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's pitfall. <laughs> so, so we'll do the real quick one you have for Pam, and then we have uh, up front, and then over here, and then we'll keep it going, so yes. So Shane and Pam, you both talked about sort of this whole transition in terms of experience, and psychologically, you're talking about moving from watching a story to actually living a story, in my words. Mm -hmm. And psychologically, that creates all sorts of new interfaces, right? And, and part of which is, how do I cue so I keep the person on track because I actually have them some level of story one level of experience. <coughs> so I'm wondering, have you done any research and gone back with Richard Gardner's old usual storytelling technique that he sort of championed 50 years ago with children? Are you are familiar with his research in that whole model? Because I'm thinking the whole experience is of usual storytelling is that if someone told the story with you. Right. Uh, and that functions as sort of a guide, as a therapeutic guide. It wasn't necessarily, it was actually a real person's avatar, but I'm curious if you see any research on, so how do we guide people through that? Does the guide become all important? So I think the question really is um, that difference of how we're moving from passive a type of um, viewing versus actually um, immersive type of viewing and what kinds of research and things are out there. Yeah. Uh, I've not seen any specific research, not yet. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not in the works, but I've not seen any. Um, Technically, I would think the best ways to do it to not completely void the immersive experience is you'd have to have some subtle visual cues and some auditory cues. That's one thing I think that gets missed so frequently in VR, um, and even worse in augmented reality, is the audio. Uh, you've got to have quality audio, and in virtual reality, now we're talking about 360 3D audio. Um, there's not many companies out there that one can make it, and two, there's even fewer out there can deliver it to your ears. So I think that that's where you're going to find some success, at least that would be a prediction of mine, is that providing those three-dimensional audio cues to get your attention, to know this is where I've got to turn my attention, the, the bottom-up processing, that's where I think it's going to be crucially important to have that audio uh, cueing. But I, I mean, I, I'm speaking completely off the cuff on that. Yeah, and I think to, to code to have co-creators of a story, that implies that the story is actually going to respond to the input of, of the other storyteller. And I think that's the dilemma where you've created a story and, and you're, really not, you're really not allowing what they say to change what's available. So, you know, unless it becomes a solve your own. So, so I think those co-creation models create another level of challenge in terms of the technology. But, um, but I have to, I'd have to go back and look at Gardner's work 50 years ago because um, And you know that might the, have as psychologists and, and researchers, that's what we'll all be doing in the next <laughs> <day>. <laughs> Right. We have no lives. <laughs> so I want to take uh, uh, one of the two of you ladies here and then over here. Go ahead. Back, electromagnetic simulation, what are those avenues of 
future? So with the technology that we have today um, and what we know about the brain, how, uh, how is virtual reality, if it is, manipulating the brain? And I, I turn it over to Linda because that's one of her areas of research, but I want to say we still, I think, even though VR has been um, used as a term VR since um, the late 80s, uh, I think we still are in beginning stages with this type of research. But Linda, what do you um, well, we alluded to it a little bit, and um, I think it goes down to um, if it's a stressful experience uh, for the person. Stress dec decreases your ability to focus and sustain positive thoughts. So right away, if you're in a VR experience that stresses you in some way, you know, maybe it wasn't even the way that they, you know, the developers had envisioned, but if it does, it's going to affect your brain, and it's not going to be a pleasant experience. Because even though the stress or the trauma or whatever it is that you're experiencing has abated, it doesn't mean that your body has followed suit. So once those cortisol, the, the prefrontal cortex and, and the stress hormones are released, it stays in your body and it continues to wreak havoc a little bit way before you thought, I'm no longer stressed or I'm no longer in this VR environment. So when you look at that, it, it, it could potentially have some long lasting and negative con you know, consequences on your body and your hormone levels, especially, you know, uh, you know, it affects your, your whole endocrine system. So I think that would probably be the biggest issue I would look for right now is how much fear is it eliciting, how much stress is it eliciting being in this environment. And that I think could be, could be problematic long term for, your, for a body. An audio. So, so just want to check. You mentioned drugs, but you're talking about drugs studies like VR studies modeled similar to that. Well, just any 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 way to affect the brain in ways conjunction with VR. With right, right, right. Well, the, like you know, we've all we've all spoken about. This is an a, an emerging field. I mean, it's an emerging field, and there's very little research that's been done on this. Now, we can take research that's been done generally on the brain in other environments, but to put them into this VR, it, it may or may not apply. We really don't know yet. And that's one thing is, as researchers, we're very excited about and also a little bit nervous about is finding out what is the impact on human behavior? What is VR's impact on human behavior? We well, don't yeah. know yet in its entirety, and, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of that. And um, yeah, Pam, I was going to say that the other thing is that, that it's important to realize that neuroscience research is an imprecise science, and so they can show where things are firing in the brain, but that doesn't necessarily impute meaning. Mm. Right. So, so it's very important to to realize that that there are limitations to, even if we took a study that wasn't having anything to do with VR and there's, oh, this is firing here, that fear and excitement and, you know, agitation, all these things fire in very similar places in the brain. So, so the meaning is not always apparent. And so it's very important not to make rash judgments mm -hmm. about, oh, this is good or this is bad or this is something or it's without you know, coming at it in a lot of different ways. There was some research that was just out. Um, it doesn't have anything to do directly here with virtual reality, but the idea that um, they used people that could read lips and people who couldn't, and then Josh showed them the video, not with any type of auditory sound, and the places in the brain that light up, lit, lit up were the areas that would normally light up if you were hearing something. So we do realize that the brain is very malleable. I want to make sure that we get a few more people because we're starting to run out of time. Um, yes? Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Steve McNally, and uh, I'm thinking more about the therapeutic arena, and really because um, Pamela is bringing it up, you know, it's 75% of the What's the cognitive behavior opportunity? I mean, I know the phobias, and I, I know some people are doing the PTS stuff in the field mm -hmm. and um, after employment, but anything about that or any studies or any place to read about it? Mm -hmm. 
So I think the question is about the link between virtual reality and mental health. You know, has anybody here heard about the therapy they're doing with VR called hero therapy? Yeah, it, it's really, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a study that was done, and some people are saying it wasn't uh, robust enough, but it, it kind of gives you an idea of where people are going in the therapeutic area. And the hero therapy is when you've got somebody in a VR environment and you tell them, you have 15 minutes to save a young girl, she's 12, and she's going to die of a diabetic shock, go into diabetic shock, and you have insulin in your pocket. So you see the guy touching his pocket, like, oh, I've got the insulin right there. And, she goes, and he says, you've got to find her and give her this medicine to save her life. And so he, you can see him looking around going, what the what? You know, and then the split screen shows him, and then it shows what he's seeing in the environment, the immersive environment. And then all of a sudden, they say, oh, by the way, you know, through his headset, you can fly. And so he's, you can tell he's kind of nervous because he's got to hurry. And then they say, just put your hands over your head and fly. So you see him going like this. And he jumps and he's, you know, he's, he's going like this. And I, we're, we're laughing, but he's in the environment. He's flying over the city. And he sees this young girl. And you can tell he's excited. He gets down. He rushes over. And he hands it to her. And they go, congratulations, you just saved her life. Right? He's the hero. So they take him out of the immersive environment. They do a, a series of, you know, um, uh, of tests and, you know, just um, uh, experimental issues. And they found that his altruistic behavior jumped tremendously after experiencing a hero scenario where he was able to be a hero. So that shows that it's they seem it's a little flimsy at this point, but you can see the direction that it has for yeah, that area. Specific to virtual reality. Well, just cognitive behavior, executive decision making, putting somebody in an environment, talk therapy, putting them in an environment that makes talk therapy maybe more robust. Well, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, but I think what we'll see as as is VR becomes uh, more accessible is that you'll see that as a way, way of delivering telemedicine. So that mm -hmm. you end up with the sense that you are with a therapist, so that it that it there's such a um, a problem with access to good therapists, especially in remote areas, so that you would actually be able to rather than just talk on the phone or even Skype, you'd actually have that sense of presence, which is really important in the therapeutic relationship. So we have just one last question all the way in the back because I know, and then I do want to say I know there's lots of hands are up. Uh, we are going to be at the fielding booth both today and tomorrow, uh, maybe a little bit on Thursday. Yeah, and most so, of us will be there all afternoon. Right, and most of us today. will be there all afternoon. So um, I'm going to take one more question and then realize that we'll be around and that you can speak with us. Yes. So the, the question that we're hearing is VR research, yeah. autism, and those type that that general area specific to the um, youth. I'm on the board of Magic Always Happens, which is a or, international organization where they are actually just starting. Uh, it's based in Cyprus, but it is global, and they're bringing into um, like T. Barry Brazelton and a whole variety of uh, children researchers, physicians, um, psychiatrists, psychologists. Again, this is a really new area. We do know from research that there's some positive ways of using media and technology that resonate specifically to children with autism. Um, I'm going to turn to the panel and see if anybody knows anything more specific to that. To address both questions on therapy, yes, I've seen a couple of studies. If you want to exchange information, I'll be happy to send this to you if I can track them down on my computer. And yes, I have seen several studies done on autism, um, especially in the uh, area of emotional understanding, uh, empathy, but also to understand the um, facial recognition of others, to understand emotional expression through that. Uh, and I've, I've got some on my computer at home. If you'd like to give me your information, I can probably send those to you. So we're down to the very last le three and a half minutes panel. <laughs> I want you to give everybody your brief takeaway, um, final takeaway for our stealth VR. 
story, 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 <laughs> story, <laughs> story. Right. again, story. Right. Yeah, and uh, be mindful of the hardwired systems. You know, you're dealing yeah. with the brain, and the brain has its own rules. So, your, you know, media rules might not line up. So it's good to know the brain's rules. And we all consult. <laughs> yeah, and I think the experience is greater than everything. It's greater than the medium. It's greater than all of that stuff. So any feeling that you have, whether it's in a tangible physical existence like this or in a virtual space, the feelings that you get there will outlast everything else and you will always remember that experience. Good or bad. Good or bad. Yeah, and I, and I think um, one thing I'm really happy to see today is the amount of questions. Not everyone had uh, ability to ask a question, but the ones that did were concerned about helping others through this medium and that gives me great joy to see that that's where people are thinking as opposed to how much more stuff can we sell these people by creating habits you know i really like the direction that that we seem to be heading into and i think we need to create a world where the citizens can be active participants in their future and using this technology as a way to give them um, to be able to seek and receive and give information that's critical to them i think is really um, is what is why we're here. So thank you very much for being here. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Oh good, good, good.